This is the Ellison in Wonderland Mental Health Podcast with your host, Ellison Fry. This is the place that looks through the looking glass and falls down the rabbit hole while discussing mental health. Join this journey that isn't just about putting mental health into a box that is only about anxiety, depression, or other common topics. Allison in Wonderland is about everything that is in that box, as well as all of the things that don't quite fit into a box. Here is your host, mental health advocate, Allison Fry. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Allison in Wonderland Mental Health Podcast. I have a great guest today who's going to tell us all about her book. But first, I want to remind everybody, I am not a doctor. I am not a licensed mental health professional of any kind. Um, I'm just a mental health advocate. I like to talk about mental health. But if you are in crisis or you know someone that's in crisis, dial 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. Also, the National Suicide Hotline recently changed their number to a three-digit code, 988, that can be called or texted from anywhere in the country, and you can get help right in the state that you're in with local support. So that number is 988. Um, so um, I would like our very special guest to introduce herself, um, Maisha. Uh, I like to have people tell us about yourself personally, who you are, and then also kind of into the topic of what, you know, has, so we understand the journey that you've gone into, not just like, hey, my, you know, what did you do? (laughs) I love to know the actual person. (laughs) Hi, everybody. So my name is Maisha Oliver. Um, Where do I start? So I am a mother. I am a professionally, I'm a healthcare recruiter. I've been recruiting for about 15 years now, so quite some time. Um, What else? I am a Christian as far as my faith, so that's a big part of my life as well. I have four kids, so I have an eight range in ages, so 21. 15, 12, and 7. Um, I'm an autism mom as well. And so that's been a great journey. I've learned so much, changed so much having him in my life. So that's been a blessing. And yeah, that was, I feel like I may have skipped over something, but that's yeah. okay. I mean, that's a, that's a lot. I'm sure there are a million other things going on too, but yeah, that's a, that's a lot. Um, it's amazing. I had to wait until my kids were grown to do any of these things because I just was like, I don't have like the the time. So absolutely a rock star that you're able to also do this and help and advocate and get your story out there um, while you have, you know, kids ranging from all ages. Because trust me, I know the 21 year old ones are still a handful too. <laughs> Still a child, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I still call my 22-year-old like a teenager. I'm like the teenager. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so recently, um, the, the most recent part of your journey is your book, um, Shatterproof. And that is, it's the main topic that we've, we're going to go over today. I'm sure we'll, as my, you know, listeners know, we will probably ramble off topic a little bit too. Um, but really, you know, what led you to um, feel like you needed to kind of put this this book together and put it out there for the world? Yeah, so when I was going through everything, so I, um, first I lost my husband and then three months later I was diagnosed. Um, and so as I got towards the end of that journey of being diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm sorry, I just realized I didn't say that earlier. Um, As I got towards, coming towards the end of chemotherapy, a lot of people were reaching out to me and just saying, wow, I I would have not known you were going through so much. Like you handled it so well. And I don't want to say I handled it well. I just had certain strategies that I used that I had already been doing. And I felt like it really helped carry me through some of the hardest moments of my life. And so because of that, I wanted to put the book together in hopes that it would help anyone else that was going through some major changes in their life, facing major adversity, um, and just some simple things that they could do to help them through it. 
I, I think that's really great. I, whenever I tell the story of, you know, what started my advocacy journey, it, it's always the story of how I lost my brother as a result of suicide in 2007. And the way I explain it to people is that I broke into like a bazillion pieces there, you know, it was like, when are you going to get better? And I'm like, well, if a building shatters to a million pieces, you can't fix it. You have to rebuild it. So, so definitely like if I had had, I'm not saying that, you know, I wouldn't have still fallen apart and things that, you know, but definitely getting to a point where I had, if I had those, you know, tools in my toolkit at the time, then maybe my grieving process would have been different because I did, I mean, like I just completely broke the, the, the Allison that was before I can only kind of see remnants of her anymore because it just, the, the journey of just completely rebuilding. Um, and I think that's, what's really special too, is it's, it's not that it's this one thing that you've gone through. Like you, you, you lost your spouse, you, you know, were diagnosed with breast cancer. You went through, you know, that you've, learned, you know, four kids is a handful, but you've also had to learn how to deal with, you know, whatever, you know, special struggles that your son has, you know, having autism, where I'm sure that he's also probably got some of the best personality, you know, of, you're probably like, oh my gosh, sure. he's, the, he's like the best of my kids. So I always, <laughs> I always hate being like the struggle of autism because, you know, he's probably like the smartest, like cutest, most adorable thing in the world. Yes, he is. Yeah. But when you have one child that's different from your others, like you've been parenting for how long? And so that I definitely learned that from the difference of my oldest and my youngest, just on how they did in school. I was like, oh, this piece mm -hmm. of cake. They go to school, they learn all the things, no struggles, no behavior issues. No. So no. it's like, if you, it's, it's like, yeah, like I, I thought I had being a mom down and then now there's, you know, this that's, different, yep. this, this whole that's new exactly person. how I feel. Yep. That's exactly how I felt. After having my three girls, I thought, okay, I've got this down pat. And Pharaoh came along, that's my son's name. And he's completely different from my other kids. Um, and then like you were saying, it was a struggle because up until then, I always had my husband. So we could tag team. It's like, hey, this child's sick. Okay, it's your turn to go get them. <laughs> right. And right. then it turned into, oh, it's just me <laughs> doing everything. Um, and so that was something I really had to adjust to. And then going back to something else that you said, how you are a different person since then. I'm definitely a different person. That yeah, totally different person than I was before everything started happening. But I'm grateful for it. I'm, I think I'm definitely a better person, but definitely a different version of Maisha than before. Yeah, I, I, I understand that too. I always, I, I try very hard not to say everything happens for a reason because I feel like, I know that people are, there, there are a lot of people that it's a very positive thing, but in my mind, it almost seems like a self-serving thing in my mind to think, well, oh, well, my brother you know, died so that I could be this better person. And, and that, that's never the message that I'm trying to, to give. But right. I, I definitely do see the butterfly effect of how that has gone through, you know, with my life. And my kids have always been the number one priority for me, like absolutely my priority. And so I would hope that like maybe if I had, if my husband hadn't been in the picture, I would have been able to rally a little more because, but I did, I had that, I was able to just be in bed and be sad and just eat pe peanut butter out of the jar because, you know, and, you know what I mean? Because he yeah, was taking care of the kids. Right. And, but hopefully, you know, I, I would hope just knowing myself that I would have been able to rally more, but it, it's really hard that you had, you know, you were grieving for your husband and dealing with this, you know, whole new way of parenting because you know it's definitely different and it may even be harder when you've had the you know <laughs> kids that are so different <laughs> and then also going yeah. through breast cancer and chemo and all of that do you do you feel like um like outside of your family unit that you're in do you have like a good support system or 
you know, are you, was it a lot of, you know, kind of stumbling through it on your own, realizing that these are the processes that work? I did have a really great support system. So I was really blessed. Um, my immediate family really rallied against me. And then I had a couple of friends that really just went over and beyond. Like, I literally had to say, don't bring any more food, please. <laughs> I'm good. I promise they would just pop up, check on me. I had family that would come and get my kids so that they weren't sitting at home, you know, worried about me. Um, so yeah, I was really blessed in that aspect. I had a lot of support. That's really, really great. So in your book, you talk about these strategies. Kind of how it, does it kind of give the story of what you went through and then compare, you know, kind of talk about the strategies that you use, or is it more of kind of like an instructional guide of like, these are the types of just daily things that you can do to help be shatterproof? So it's a little bit of both. I give stories and then I give some instructions or guides on what I did to help me through each story. I would give an example. Um, like one strategy is learning how to respond versus react. Um, and that's something I learned before all of this happened. Just in my career, you know, when I first started working, I was young. And if someone said something crazy to me on the phone, I just was like, okay, bye. Hang up. All right. I'm quitting this job. <laughs> bye, Felicia. <laughs> bye. I'm gone. I don't want to deal with this. Um, but, you know, I eventually learned how to respond, which is to process the information first, review what, you know, my next step should be before I react. And I remember um, when I first got into healthcare recruiting, so I was an agency recruiter. Prior to that, you know, agency recruiting is very different from healthcare when you're working in a corporation. Right. So you're really hands-on dealing with different personalities in healthcare recruiting. So I remember I literally would have to hang up the phone and go walk around the parking lot four times to calm down. <laughs> And, you know, now I'm at a point today where someone could get upset. And it's not that I don't care. It just doesn't affect me. I, I, you know, I know how to process it very differently. And I'm just speaking very calmly to them. Um, but the strategy that I give respond versus react was when I was um, diagnosed. And instead of I fell apart. And then I sat in my car. I probably sat in my car for a couple of hours by myself. And I just processed everything. And by the time I got out of the car, I started making a strategy. I thought about, you know, what I was going to do, what I was willing to do on my journey as far as, you know, you have to make decisions about, are you going to get a mastectomy? Are you going to, you know. And it's different for radical. everybody. Yeah. Like it's, right. it's what's right for you right might not be home. right for someone else. Exactly. And so I just sat there before I told anyone anything else about it. I sat there and processed it. And then by the time I went home, you know, I was okay. I didn't, I didn't talk to my kids about it. I did tell my mother. That was the only person I told at first. I didn't tell my kids until my actual health care plan was outlined. And then I had a conversation with them because I wanted to come to them with information to be able to say, OK, this has happened, but this is what we're going to do. And so I give a, give a strategy, um, respond versus react. And some of the things that I've processed through in the book, because that really helped me out a lot. And I was able to pull that into that situation. Yeah, that's it. That's amazing. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, have has kind of been my takeaway in life, too, is that, you know, I did have that fall apart moment. And now I kind of in my mind have a plan for what I would do if anything happened. Like I I, I have. And so the plans help me. And my I, I will call myself a worst case scenario. It's like I know I know exactly what to do if such and such happens. So yeah. um when when I know we were talking about this before the call, you hit 40 and it's like, OK, um, now all these things are a risk. But I had just moved and I had a new primary care doctor and he's like, well, you have to go get your first mammogram. And then I um, 
I also got an email from like every doctor I'd ever seen in my life that was like, hey, you're 40, go get a mammogram. Yeah. So I went and got it and I was like, no big deal. And I remember everybody telling me that like a mammogram is the most painful, awful thing in the world. And to me, I was like, this isn't terrible. Like what, like why were y'all, I was like, I've had babies. Like, I don't understand. Like, this wasn't that bad. Like, like, um, but then I got the call that I needed to go to the hospital and have another one. And that was when I was like, but they were like, it's super normal after your first mammogram because they don't have anything to compare it to. And so I was like, okay, I, that that's fine. I'll, that That's cool. And then it was the next day when I got the call that was like, we need you to come back to the hospital. That's like an hour and a half away to get the ultrasound. And I, and I was, and that was when I was, I was starting to get a little stressed out, but then also yeah. in my mind knew exactly like I, like I, my husband knew what was going on, but my kid, my 19 year old still lives here and everything. But so like no one else really did. And in my mind, I knew exactly what steps I would have to take depending on how that went because I'd already planned those things out. Um, like yeah. years ago, I had, I actually had a cancer gene study done because my, my OBGYN in Georgia was not comfortable with the fact that my mom passed away at 50 and I didn't have like all of this medical history knowledge oh, yeah yeah so i know that i don't have any genetic markers but in that they do a um therapy session basically with you to see if you're able to accept whatever information they come back with and i had decided then if they come back and say you've got this i would do the mastectomy i would do you know have the hysterectomy I, like i knew at that point so like i i had already kind of had those things in my mind um, but then when COVID hit and my husband's pay got dropped and people kept getting laid off and he was like, I don't understand why are you stressed about everything? Why, why? And I was like, there was no way for me to plan this. I can't plan what we're going to do. <laughs> I was like, it's the one time in my life where I was like, nope, not out of my hands. We'll just see where the car is. It really was. Oh. There was nothing anyone could do. It's, there was right. no plan for it. We had never experienced anything like that before. Right, exactly. Now I kind of know what I would do if there was, you know, yeah. if it got really bad again, but um, it definitely, the planning, I think, in my mind, that really resonates with me on how to, to get through those things and respond and not react. I think that that's, um, like, I almost need to have that, that little, I need a sticky note that says on my monitor. Well, I need to respond, that's right, yeah. Another thing um, that I talk about in the book, since we're talking about planning, is just planning out your day. Like I'm really big on, I have my digital, I probably have too many things. I have my digital calendar on my iPad. I have my sticky notes as well. But it really helped me when I was going through um, the grief process, when I was going through chemotherapy, radiation, I would plan out everything every day because it helped me to feel that I was moving forward, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And so even with planning uh, his services, I remember my mom came and she was like, I can't believe you did everything yourself. And I was like, I just did it. Like, I just, I got my notepad and I wrote out, okay, I have to do this. I have to do this. And so it really helped me move through all everything, just making a plan, sticking to your plan, getting things done. Um, another thing I talk about in the book, something as simple as getting up and getting dressed. Oh, I know. Which... I, I Sometimes I think taking a shower is like a strong victory for me. I mean, I work Listen. from home. It's like, it's like, seriously, guys, if y'all realized that I, I, I no longer wash my hair, I don't <laughs> It just doesn't happen. That's the thing. Yeah, I work from home as well. And yeah, just me getting up. I take my son to school, but I try to get in and put on a little lipstick or a look, you know, try to pull myself together a little bit. And it helps me feel a lot better doing something as little as that, as small as that. Yeah, my Aunt Tracy always would say um, something about making sure your lips are on. And um, she passed away a couple of years after my mom did. And, um, she was like my mom's like sister, but not sister. So she was like, you know, so her, her daughter, that was um, my cousin, who's not my cousin. Um, yeah. 
she wasn't able to deliver like her eulogy, but her friend read what she had written at the very end of it. And I, and I don't know why it always sticks out in my mo- mind. She was like, and yes, mom, I have my lips on. And I just thought it was so sweet because it was just like Good. such an aunt, aunt Tracy thing to say, where like, even through all of the really hard things that were going on. Yes. She had her lips yeah. on. Like she, she yeah. did that. My mom's the same way. It's so funny. If I post something online, she'll go, oh, that was so great, but you forgot to wear your lipstick. You didn't have one. I'm like, okay, mom. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like, I I had one of those days today where I was like, I should have probably put more makeup on. I didn't, like, check the lighting. And I'm like, oh, well, this is just, I'm just like, it's fine. Um, But my mom was always that way, too, where it was very much like, you don't show your toes unless they're painted. So like yes. legitimately, <laughs> I don't wear open toe shoes because my toe nails are never painted. Just <laughs> to walk, work around. My t- no one ever sees my toes because they're never painted. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, almost the same way. It's interesting though because you know when my when my mom passed away three years after my brother, I did have that planning role. I had already put it in my mind like what I would do, mm-hmm. and it was. And I think a lot of people were like, how, like, just very surprised that I was able to go through all of it. But in my mind, I was doing it so my little brother and sister didn't have to do it. I dealt with the organ donation people. I, you know, set up the services and dealt with cremation and all of those things. And then it was like, after I got all of that done, then it like hit me, like the grief part of it hit me because it was like, and it, and it's, it's not that I was not feeling what I needed to feel, but it did help me have this task list and be like, these are the things that I need to do. And it helped me focus it. I'm not saying anyone should not feel the grief that they need to feel. Right. But you know, like if you're able to do the things and that doesn't mean everyone, it's, it's like you and I seem to be very big planners that does yeah. not mean that it's wrong for someone else if they lose their spouse to have someone else plan the service. It. Like it's yeah. right. Like it's the, you know, full if you have the the resource or the help and you've got your your tribe, then like pull them in if if it's just yeah. not, you know, take care of yourself. Um, but it sounds like you and I both are very much like taking care of ourselves as having that list to check stuff off. Like we've got some, yep. we, but we we've you know made it through five things today. And I think that's a really healthy thing about list in general. Everyone has everything online, but what they don't realize is how nice it is to actually mark something off of a piece of paper. So satisfying. Yes. So satisfying. (laughs) It's like, I'm not saying, uh, you know, kill trees for paper or whatever, but seriously, like have these little, like, I, I love the lined sticky notes and I'm like, here's my list and I like to mark them off and it's just like, look at what I accomplished where kind of at the end of the day, you might feel like, what did I accomplish today? Well, look, I marked 10 things off. One of them may have been like, wash my hair, but I did it. I brushed my teeth. Yeah. You got it done. (laughs) Yeah. Take kid to school. Check. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Check. Um, and if they want to mark if something off in their digital person even with my ipad i take my little pen and i go through and mark things off and it helps me stay on track yeah i mean i mean and maybe there's a younger generation that never had to mark things off of lists that doesn't feel that way but for to to me it's it's very satisfying um like marking chores off when i was a kid definitely um well i mean like those are it, it, so it sounds like the the book, like I'm absolutely, I feel so bad that I didn't get a chance to um, read it before we hopped on. I know um, usually the listeners have me saying like, oh, in this part of the book and no one listening realizes the back and forth that we've had where I'm like, oh my God, I have to reschedule again because I'm clumsy and <laughs> fell and hurt my wrist. So I, you know, I'm, I feel very behind on things, but it definitely sounds like a lot of what works for you or the same kinds of things that I've found that work for me. So I'm very interested to see what else is in there that I haven't figured out because I think that it probably would also be a really good tool for me to like implement in my life because let's face it, like we've been through a lot, but that doesn't mean tomorrow is not going to have something else. 
you know, exactly drop in our laps yeah. that we have to, that we have to respond to and not react to. So that's, that it's, it's a really, it's a really beautiful concept. I mean, honestly, like it's, it's neat learning about it on the call with you the same time everyone else is going to be learning <laughs> about it. And you're also, um, you're kind of developing a coaching program for women to, to do this as well, right? Yes. Yep. So I'm working through that now, putting together a coaching program. Because um, the main thing I want to do is help other women. Because uh, women, I feel as women, we have so much on us. So much is expected. And a lot of times when we go through situations, it's really just us. A lot of women are on their own dealing with trauma, dealing with death, dealing with health issues. And so I'm, I'm putting together a program where I'm going to combine my professional experience as well as some life experience and hopefully be able to help women process through major transitions in their life. Yeah, I think that I think that that's really great. And I know that it's funny because I've had so many women on the show um, and I'm always like, I'm, try, I'm not going to make this be a feminist podcast. But honestly, when you think about the fact that you know, 75 to 80% of the people in therapy are women. It's not that men need less therapy. They're just not doing it. So it's, um, I'm yeah, probably good, that, which all. means, which means I'm probably going to have like a 75 to 80% audience of women. It's just, if, women, if you follow yeah. the math, like that's how it, how it is. Um, and it, there are a lot of things that we go through. Um, I know that I had a conversation with my husband recently where he was like, you're acting like a completely different person. What's, what, like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I, you know, I've been a mom like this whole time and my son does live in the guest house on the property, but he's like, but I don't think he really understood the shift. Like I'm still empty nesting. I'm not the, the theater mom. I'm not on the school board of doing, you know, the theater program. I'm not doing this and that. And I don't have all of, you know, these teenagers like using my house as a hub. It's, it's very different. Um, yeah. And it's, and at the age that I'm at, I'm 40. I don't, no one else I know is going through it. <laughs> they're, they're all, they're all on like their second marriages having babies. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely interesting. And I think that also, and I will probably mention this on so many episodes, but, um, but years ago, my father-in-law made this comment to me that when, um, when men talk and, and, and complain and have concerns, they're talking, but when women do it, they're nagging. And I, and I think he was, and I, and I don't know that he was so much saying that that's what it was, but that, that that's the way it's perceived. And it has right. stuck in my head. We've been married over 21 years. That has stuck in my head for 21 years that when men hear us talking, they hear nagging. And so I think it's important to have that group of women that can support you and lift you up and, and not feel like, oh my gosh, what hormonal drama is going on here about. Yeah. yeah. Somebody that understands everything that you're going through, the different emotions that we go through as women. Um, yeah. And you mentioned therapy. I definitely, I discussed that in the book as well, because after the service of my husband is when I realized it was like, uh, yeah, we all need therapy. Me, my kids, like, cause it was a sudden passing. And so that really helped me as well going through, um, therapy. Yeah. That's I'm, I'm one of those where I, it was really hard finding a therapist when my brother passed away. And so it, I feel like it took me forever to find one that I really am comfortable with. Um, but when I, I moved to Georgia and, and found the the therapist that I'm with now um, for the last six years. Um, I went there. I had gone through a lot of my grieving and stuff, and we would we'd get there and just not. I mean, I was in school for my second degree in, in psychology, and we were we would kind of talk about stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, I learned this cool thing. But I told her like it's there for like mental, like monthly mental maintenance is what I would call it. But really, it was to have that relationship so that if something happened, she was there. And yeah. that's, and that's really, and what's interesting is that, um, this at 2022 was just like this really rough year for me, um, toxic career environment. We were moving. So like, I couldn't leave my job because we were in the process of buying this farm and stuff. So it was just like 
the first time that I think that she'd ever been like, wow, you actually like, like, like I really needed help. I was like, I actually need more. Like, we've got this great relationship, but it was great because she was already there and she already knew everything and she could tell the difference in my, like my just conversation with her yeah. and how I felt. So it was great to have that relationship. Um, but you, it's great that you had the awareness that like the whole family needs it. I always told my husband, if I die tomorrow, you take the kids to therapy. Like I, I would, it, it, because he doesn't believe as much in therapy, which is crazy. I have two degrees in psychology and I run a mental health podcast. So he's like, <laughs> He's like, um, why don't you just, you don't, you don't need people to get there. That's such a man. <laughs> I know. Um, but like I, and it, and it wasn't that I thought that I was just like, you know, me being gone was the end of the world, but I knew that I wouldn't be there to help the kids with whatever they were going through. And so it was like yeah. one of those things I made him promise. Like if anything ever happens to me, you make sure the kids that are in therapy, like that's just it it's really important and it's and it's good that you were able to be like everybody needs this we all need to kind of go through this transition yeah, and when I when I really thought about it I realized that my my girls didn't want to upset me right but I wanted them to process their feelings at the same time so they needed someone totally different that they could talk to no judgment and they could have those conversations with talk about how angry they were uh, one of my girls was really angry after um his passing and so hers talking to someone else she wouldn't talk to me about it but talking to someone else really helped yeah and I think that's important to note too I mean I have um I always say it's a casserole family because I've got, you know, my brothers and sisters up from my mom's and my brothers and sisters from my dad's. But um, I know that I, I had um, a foster sister who passed away from cancer a few years ago. And on the, the anniversaries of my mom's passing and my brother's passing, she would always send out this group text about how she was thinking about all of us, which was really sweet. And I always would share posts about suicide prevention on those days. Um, but I did have a sister that was like, I would like to just go through these days without people reminding me, like I want it to just be right. another day. And it's just so important to realize that everyone, that's not a, that's not an invalid feeling. You know what I mean? Like I, mm -hmm. I have to take St. Patrick's Day off work every year because my mom died on St. Patrick's Day. And I it's very close, like it like it's very ingrained in my mind because like everybody I, I mean, I had kids, but all of the other people in my family were like out bar hopping and stuff when we were giving them the news. So it's a it like it's very it's not like oh it was St. Patrick's Day. Like there was, it was just that I remember people being out at those events when it happens. When it happens. And yeah. And if it was just another day, if it looks like if it was any other day where people weren't like, you're not wearing green and stuff, then I could probably deal with it. But um, I think everybody deals with those things the same and they don't, it's not wrong to say, please don't remind me every time this comes up, you know, those anniversaries yeah. are hard. So it's, it's great that y'all were able to all kind of get help in the way that it you, you needed it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, I've had my son tell me he doesn't want to s upset me about things sometimes. So my my youngest mm -hmm. for for a little while had decided he was going to join the military, and I very closely tie um, my brother's loss to um, breakdowns in the system with the VA after he was um, released from the Air Force after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and then they miss um medicaid did it was just a whole mess um or it, and i'm not like blaming the va hey we need to support our veterans which means they need more resources but, you know what i mean like there's it's a whole systematic issue i'm not saying like damn the military but like um my son was scared to tell me that he wanted to join the military so he'd like known for two years that that's what he wanted to do so it's wow. it's interesting though like your your kids not wanting to like they want to protect you too and people don't right. really think about that so it's it is really great that that you're like okay they need to talk about it and if they're not going to talk about it with me <laughs> yeah they had to talk to someone for sure yeah
Well, that, it's all it, it's all really great. So, with your your coaching program, and I know you're that's in development. Is it is it going to kind of be like a course, or how did you envision it? Do you envision it as a course or as like a community? I'm thinking I'm leaning more towards community and maybe um, some individualized one on one meetings. Yeah, um, as well. I've taken a lot of courses and I feel like just with this type of subject matter, it might be like too much of a disconnect for someone. So I'm thinking a community would be a better fit. Yeah. So I'm, I'm involved in one that's um, focused around disordered eating and it's only for women. It's like, it's, and once again, it's not like, it's not like men don't have those struggles, but it is so mm -hmm. that so everyone goes through the course and responds to things about the book and things and then they talk to each other and i think that if it wasn't all women maybe it, we would feel a little bit more judged about and i know that's really terrible i i swear everybody i don't hate men <laughs> that's not what i'm saying <laughs> i'm just it's it's just we have to understand that we are different and we respond differently yeah. and that we might, some people might be a little apprehensive to share those things if it's not a community, but so it is, it's the same. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a course and like a, a community that you're all going through it together. And then also one-on-one -on -one sessions, if you want them or need them or, you know, go without direction. Yeah. And it's, it's such a beautiful thing being able to talk about like, yeah, I stress eat, which means I eat all the time when I'm not hungry. I eat like a box and a half of sugar-free popsicles a day because I have found that that at least keeps me from eating a bag of Reese cups. Okay. <laughs> but I, I love that idea. And when it's, when it's launched, we'll definitely have to have you come back on and talk about yeah. the course and the community, all of it, that that'll be really exciting. Um. I realized that I talk so much. <laughs> Did I? No, um, uh, so I know, sorry for dominating the conversation. Um, is there <laughs> anything that you wanted to share that I just completely missed? <laughs> I can't think of anything. I feel like we we talked about the book. We talked about some of the strategies. Um, I'm available on all platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, everything under um, Mike Oliver. So if anyone wants to connect, feel free to reach out to me. Any feedback on the book, I would love to hear it. Wonderful. Yes. And I will make sure everything's linked and that you are tagged in all of my social posts for it. Um, so I am, I'm really excited. Thank you so much. And thank you for being patient with me as I um, rescheduled on you a million Teams. I really this appreciate it. It is fine. Thank you so much for having me. I think the work that you're doing is wonderful. Well, thank you. You too. I mean, I, I feel like I, I, I like I felt bad for not having read the book, but now I just want to read it even more. It's, it's great. I'm like, this is, you're definitely like, you're speaking my jam. Like you're right there. <laughs> well, um, oh, cool. Thank you, Maisha. It was really great talking to you. And um, I cannot wait to see what um, what you do in the future. I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Also, remember, this show does not contain medical advice that you should follow without speaking to your doctor. If you or someone you know is in crisis, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. You can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988.